greetings everybody and welcome uh, to my continued series on themes of world history. This lecture in particular is actually part of a, a Canadian history series uh, setting us up for uh, Canada's role in the Second World War. So we're going to be sort of taking a very sort of uh, topical sort of overview of the main themes and threads of dictatorships of the 1930s. If you're interested in more detailed accounts of the rise of the Nazis or the rise of Joseph Stalin or even Benito Mussolini for that matter, please uh, don't hesitate to look at my lectures that deal specifically with those people in those periods of history uh, because they'll be quite a bit more in depth than what we'll cover here. So at the end of the day, the ultimate function here is to set us up for, as I said, Canada's role in the Second World War. You know, one of the things that people ask me, and, and I've had many discussions with people about the idea of, you know, what on earth happened in the 1930s? I mean, we know that the Depression was, was going on. Why was the Depression pushing people to the left or the right? Well, it's pretty straightforward. If people had lost everything, they lost their mortgages, they lost their homes, they lost their jobs, they were out on the street, um, desperate times lead to desperate measures and I think it wasn't uh, surprising really that people would be looking for alternatives to the system, the democratic system, that they'd known and had come to love, but one which had collapsed right in front of them and had not only destroyed their lives but their families' lives as well. So uh, out of that um, we get politics of desperation, I would call it, too. So that's kind of where things are at at this point. So, um, so like I say, we're going to look at these uh, main threads, main themes, and, uh, and hope to put together a sort of an understanding of, of how these societies functioned and how they existed during this time. So while the Western democracies grappled with solutions for dealing with the Great Depression, some European countries moved towards fascist or communist systems. Now, in the case of the Soviet Union, they had uh, moved in that direction in 1917. So 20, you know, 12 years rather before the start of the Depression, they were already on a firm footing towards uh, Marxism-Leninism type of system. Benito Mussolini as well came into power in 1922, so he predates the Depression by seven years. But I think it was the Nazis who really uh, were inheritors of the consequence of 1929, that really in many ways the Depression was a gift to the Nazis because we saw their appeal fluctuate throughout the 20s and during that golden period of 1924 to 29, um, their uh, popularity had plummeted uh, only to shoot up through the roof once the crash of 29 happened. So. In the Soviet Union, Joseph Stalin took power in 1928, four years after the death of Lenin, the founder of the Soviet state. The story and narrative of the rise of Stalin is a remarkable story of determination, malevolence, uh, Machiavellian tactics, you name it, um, cutthroat politics, gutter tactics. Um, he was... Um, he didn't lack stealth, he didn't lack um, uh, the understanding of how to isolate people. He have to, you have to consider that Stalin was very much a revolutionary of the fist. He was very working class, grew up very, very poor. And many of the intellectual communists in Russia at the time, maybe Nikolai Bukharin or um, Kamenev and Zinoviev, certainly Lenin and Trotsky, these were all intellectuals, you know, they were academics. They were not necessarily bloodthirsty murderers. Um, but Joseph Stalin had that sort of tough guy mentality. And, uh, you know, he had these, what were called these yellow tiger-like eyes that could pierce you and stare you down. So Joseph Stalin, once again, we won't be getting into heavy detail of his life in this lecture, but if you are interested, please have a look at my uh, Stalin lecture. I'll go quite a bit into those kinds of details. So. Um, so when Lenin dies in 1924, there's quite a power struggle that occurs, but unfortunately because Joseph Stalin had been appointed General Secretary by Lenin before the, his death, 
Um, that position was responsible for making appointments to the Communist Party. So he was able to really manipulate events in such a way that he could find alliances and he could ostracize those people he didn't trust. So by 1928, Stalin is in full charge in the Soviet Union. His cruel and ruthless leadership contributed to millions of deaths as he sought rapid industrialization. I'm always, always very leery of arbitrarily throwing out statistics um, because I don't think we can ever know for certain those kinds of numbers. But it is fair to say, and the evidence is very clear, that in the Ukraine famine alone, 1932 to 33, that was a, a, a form of punishment where Stalin cut off all road and railway links because he was punishing the Ukraine as a result of their resistance to his collectivization policies. Collectivization is, is state-run agriculture. And so in that one-year period, we know that upwards of four to five million Ukrainian people were killed. When we get to the Great Purges and the Great Terror of 36 to 38, those numbers continue to grow. It's fair to say that millions and millions of Russian people died at the hands of Stalin even before the Second World War started. Um, he, uh, people had to navigate their relationship with him. They had to be very, very careful around him. And I think probably more so Stalin than any of the other dictators that, you know, you didn't want to ingratiate yourself too much around him because then he might think, oh, what are you up to? You're being awfully nice to me. If you would make the decision to be remote and stay in the back, that could equally be dangerous because then he might think, what are you doing in the back? You haven't said anything lately. What are you up to? You know, um, so the, the, the state that he creates, the state of terror, is quite remarkable. And that period, particularly from 36 to 38, uh, sees hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, either murdered uh, or sent to the Gulag archipelago throughout much of Siberia. So anyway, that story will come back to another time. In Italy in 1922, here he is up here, uh, Benito took power and created a fascist state, government rather, a system opposed to democracy and in favor of strong nationalistic militarism with the complete control of the media by the state. Now, of course, of the big three up on the board here, um, Benito was the first. And there's very little doubt, in my opinion, that Joseph Stalin would have been looking at what Benito Mussolini was doing. Um, we know that, for example, Adolf Hitler had a grudging admiration for Joseph Stalin. He was fascinated the way he dealt with his political enemies. He said, we can learn a lot from this guy. So even though these people were all, these three individuals were very um, uh, mistrustful of each other, I think they looked to each other uh, to understand what they themselves could get away with in their own countries. But either way, the commonality between these dictatorships is pretty straightforward. No democracy, no freedom of speech, it's either my way or the highway, um, and secret police organizations to keep people in line. So in that respect, whether it be Stalinist or fascist, uh, those commonalities, uh, commonalities rather existed amongst all the dictatorships. However, it was in Germany where fascism would gain immense power under the leadership of Adolf Hitler. One of the great ironies of fascism at this time is the idea that when Hitler does come into power, he's a great admirer of Benito Mussolini. And much of what he does even throughout the 20s is an attempt to emulate what Mussolini has done in Italy. So, for example, look at the March on Rome, um, you know, of uh, 1922. Uh, if I get my year correct, it's 22 or 24, I'd have to look. Um, but either way, Hitler's attempt at the Beer Hall Putsch was an attempt to emulate that, because eventually, if Hitler had been successful in the Beer Hall Putsch in Munich, his plan was to march on Berlin. You know, Benito Mussolini had his black shirts, um, Adolf Hitler had his brown shirts, and so on and so on and so forth. So it's kind of ironic that um, when Hitler does come to power, of course, these two were not friendly. Um, Mussolini did not trust Hitler. But when they do become friendly by 36, when they both get involved in the Spanish Civil War, Hitler had eclipsed Mussolini's power tenfold by that point. But it's a very interesting dynamic to be 
hero worshiping someone that you are now much more powerful than. But nonetheless, his his loyalty to Mussolini continued right to the end of the war. So, all right, let's look at Germany after the war. Um, the German economy never recovered after World War One, largely due to the terms of the Treaty of Versailles. Once again. This is a topic that requires uh, much more detail than just a mere footnote, uh, as I am doing in this lecture. Uh, so please have a look at my lecture dealing with the Paris Peace Conference and the Treaty of Versailles, where I discuss these things in detail. Um, but it's fair to say that um, when they were given this bill, uh, huge millions and millions of dollars that they had to pay in reparation payments, um, their economy was already in the tank. Everybody's economy was in the tank, and Germany didn't have any money. So eventually the British and the French, particularly the French and the Belgians, for example, would take things in kind. So they would take their coal, they would, you know, exploit their labor, whatever it may be, whatever way that they could pay back these reparations. But what we see happening in Germany after the war was a period of economic snowballing. and. Uh, the 1929 hyperinflation led to uh, dramatic consequences for the German economy. And it just seemed to be that Germany was never able to kind of get a grip on, on its economy. In the early 1920s, Germany printed more money to pay reparations, and the economy experienced severe inflation. You know, when you look at the new German government that was created, by the way, they were handed power officially on the... 10th of November, because the Kaiser, Kaiser Wilhelm II, abdicated the day before. And when they became this new power, um, the reason they became the government was because they had the largest political party in Germany at the time. And uh, the two military operators of the time, uh, Paul von Hindenburg and Erich Lindendorf, Ludendorff rather, would pass on uh, power to the, 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 this young republic on the 10th and say, okay, it's all yours, you've been whining about democracy for years, there you have it. Oh, and by the way, you've got to sign an armistice at 11 o'clock tomorrow, which they did. So some say that uh, the Weimar Republic, as it's called, was kind of almost set up to take the fall for everything that was wrong in the war. And of course, the stab in the back myth uh, leads to the rise of the Nazis. All that is built around the idea that Germany was betrayed by those who not only signed the armistice of November 11th and those who signed the Treaty of Versailles in uh, June of 1919. So you know, becomes a perfect scapegoat for the Nazis because they can now point their finger and lay blame. But anyway, the struggles these, this government faced were quite remarkable. In 1920, 21, they began to print off more money to pay off their debts. And unfortunately, they printed so much money that the value of their currency completely plummeted, went through the roof and uh, through the, through, through the, yeah, through the roof is good enough, I suppose, um, or through the ground. Um, so, when the economy collapses on this, this, this level, people that had savings in the bank lost everything. People had the rug pulled out from under, uh, under them. I mean, money had become so worthless where, for example, in early 1921, a loaf of bread might have cost 60, mar or 60 fennigs, we'll call it 60 cents for the sake of reference. That 60 cent loaf of bread in early uh, 1921 would be worth $250 million by the end of 1921. So just to give you an, an idea of the dramatic hyperinflation that existed. Money had become so worthless, and if you can see this picture here, it's a photograph of children playing almost sort of Lego type games with stacks of money. In addition, on payday, workers would be told on Thursday, hey, it's payday tomorrow. Make sure that you bring your wheelbarrow because um, tomorrow's payday. And of course, they come with these sacks of money and dump them in their wheelbarrow and off they would go. So you could see rows of wheelbarrows outside factories uh, the day before payday in preparation for their, the mother load of money they were going to get, which unfortunately for them was worthless. Uh, with a, while there was a period of stability which occurred in the mid 20s when uh, reparations were reduced by France and Britain. Uh, not only that, but the, uh, the Dawes plan and the Young plan, uh, negotiated by American bankers, also negotiated a reduction in payments and amortizing them over longer periods of time. Uh, the crash of 1929 sent Germany's economy into collapse. So the period from 1924 to 1929 is known in German history as the Golden Age or the Golden Era. 
and it was overseen by a chancellor or president by the name of Gustav Stresemann. Gustav Stresemann managed to get a new currency to have it reflect uh, the health or lack of health of the economy uh, because of course uh, uh, the nation's currency is based on so many variables in the, how much employment is there in the country, how much are you selling, how much are you importing, supply, demand, all those things. So a new currency is, is formed. Um, they're accepted in the League of Nations. Uh, they're beginning to come out of the cold during the Weimar period. What's very interesting is that we see the appeal of the Nazis plummet. I think they, they were down to about 3% in 1928, and, uh, but 1929 comes along. And just when people were beginning to feel secure in Germany, and have faith in this new republic, they had the rug pulled out from under them in 1929. While the Nazi party had been around since 1919, it was after the depression when people were pushed to the extremes when they started paying attention. When the Nazi party starts and is formed in 1919, if you look at or read the transcripts to Hitler's speeches in the beer halls of Bavaria in the early 20s, right up through the early 30s, the speeches are exactly the same. Versailles is a crime, the Jews are to blame, so on and so forth. Um, so I think the reason people began to listen was simply for the fact that the Nazis had been around long enough, nothing else was working, and they were willing to give them a try. I mean, you know, What's remarkable is we talked about the idea that a 1928 Nazi party vote was, I think, like 2.8%, 3%. By 1932, they were up to 37%. What a leap. And uh, at the end of the day, I think that people were willing to see what they could offer. Um, and yes, people were aware of, of the more, uh, the darker elements of the party, but they hoped that Maybe those kinds of things would materialize. They thought, well, let's just see what they can do if they can get our economy going. So um, by 1929 and thereafter, I think it was sort of an act of desperation. And certainly for Paul von Hindenburg, who was the president in 1933, who appointed him chancellor. Because chancellors were not elected. They were appointed by the president, uh, who would be elected on a seven-year term. So Paul von Hindenburg, yes, the same Hindenburg from World War I, um, basically appointed him out of desperation. In fact, we know Hindenburg did not like uh, Adolf Hitler. He referred to him as that bohemian corporal. But nonetheless, the decision was made to give this guy a shot. Um, the other piece I should mention, too, is that Hindenburg was coming under strong pressure from business interests who were saying, look, there's a lot of this stuff we don't like about the Nazis, too, but the reality is they're going to clean house on our labor problems and we're going to get the economy going. So if, if you appoint this guy, um, we will get fully behind the government. Business interests will. So unfortunately for Hindenburg, there really wasn't a lot of choice. Plus, in 1933, they were the largest party with 37-38% in the Reichstag, which is Germany's parliament. So it was kind of inevitable that they were going to take power. Hitler's clever use of propaganda, mass rallies and fear helped him gain power in 1933 when he was appointed Chancellor. One of the great Shakespearean tragedies of the 20th century, you know, that, that Hitler had come to power by the democratic and constitutional process in the Weimar Constitution, but by July 1936, he had basically destroyed every element of democracy in that country, you know. And and uh, once again, there's quite a remarkable story when even when you're looking at something like the enabling laws of February after the parliament had been burned down. Um, a lot of things were happening where people would just kind of say, "Well, let's just see what he does," you know. Uh, it's too simplistic to say that all German people were rabid Nazis and they were all, all anti-Semitic and so on and so forth. I think that people were desperate. Um, the middle classes were more fearful of having their property taken away from the communists than they were from racist policies of the Nazis. So when it came to having to choose between the two, you know, um, a lot of people were pushed to the right for that very reason. So 
So Hitler had the perfect scapegoat in the Versailles Treaty to rally Germans behind him. I mean, you know, and this comes back to the argument to what extent is the Treaty of Versailles responsible for the rise of the Nazis? I mean, boy, the, the, that could be... I've had many discussions about this, and let's put it in this perspective, that if the Treaty of Versailles had not existed, or if it wasn't as punitive as it was, would the Nazis have been relevant? It's fair to say that the Nazis would have been around, those ideas, those, the, that kind of thinking had been around for quite some time. So I think the Nazi party would have evolved in some shape or form, um, to what extent Hitler would have been the leader, to what extent it would have grown quite so significantly is another question, and a question we simply can't answer. But there's no question that the Treaty of Versailles becomes the perfect scapegoat to, you know, and the thing is, the other piece I should mention too about the Treaty of Versailles is the idea that everybody hated it. It wasn't a, it wasn't a partisan issue. It wasn't just the socialists didn't like it. Fascists hated it, communists hated it, liberals, conservatives, everybody in Germany disliked the Treaty of Versailles, particularly the war guilt clause. So if you can rope in liberals by, you know, going on about the Treaty of Versailles and then hoodwink them once you get their support, uh, in that regard the Treaty of Versailles became a very, very useful and powerful tool for Germans, for the German Nazis rather, to gain power. So. Very interesting stuff. Um, when Hitler became leader, he banned all political opposition, refused to pay reparations to the West, and started his quest to remilitarize Germany. You know, he wants to prove to the German people that he's tough, that he's not going to take any crap from anyone, he's going to cancel reparation payments, he's going to get everybody a job. And, and the, the irony and the tragic irony, and I say it's a tragedy because, well, I'll, I'll demonstrate why it's a tragedy. By 1936, Germany was economically on fire. People were working, people were happy, and the reason I say that's a tragedy is because once he'd proven and come through on some of his promises about employment, it was very easy for him to manipulate people. So the fact that they had now gained to trust him because he made promises that he kept, they were willing then to look away at the dark and ugly aspect of political oppression and anti-Semitism that existed. Because at the end of the day, if you have a job and you have um, a family to take care of and all, bills to pay, you're going to do everything you can to protect yourself and your family. And, uh, you know, you have to make choices. It's really that simple. And I want to give you an example because one of the questions that come up to me quite a bit in my classes is, why is it that Germany, a modern, civilized nation, could descend into such butchery and savagery? That's a great question. I'm going to give you an analogy or an, an example of, 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 of uh, how to kind of come to terms with how this thing could happen on a personal human level. So let's pretend you are living in Berlin in 1936. You're aware of the political oppression. You're aware of the bigotry. You're aware of the fact that there are people going missing. Um, however, you're working, your family's safe, your bills are paid, and while you recognize that there's dark elements in the country, you feel that as long as you keep your chin up and you move forward, you are very careful with who you communicate with about what topic, all will be well. So here's your option. It's 1936. You're looking out your front window across the street where Mr. Smith lives, and you see him being abruptly removed from his home by a couple of Gestapo and SS soldiers. He's dragged by the heels around the corner, down to the police station, and you have three choices of how you're going to react to that set of circumstances. Number one, you're going to go down to the police station and you're going to say, I demand to know what on earth you were arresting Mr. Smith for. I've known him for 10 years, he's been a good neighbor, and I'm here to defend his honor. I can stand by him as a good German. That's option number one. Option number two is you close the blinds, you don't tell anybody what you saw, not even your wife. You shiver and think, by gosh, I hope this doesn't happen to me, and then you move on in life. Right? Close the blinds, pretend you didn't see it. Option number three is 
you go down to the police station, you say, excuse me, I just came down here to let you know that I want to thank you for doing your duty, that Mr. Smith guy, never trusted him, always shady characters coming around, and I just want you to know that I really appreciate you looking after us. Okay? So to review, to, to review number one, defend Mr. Smith. Number two, ignore what you saw. Number three, um, accuse Mr. Smith for fear that if you demonstrate if you demonstrate this kind of loyalty to the state, then maybe the Nazis won't come for you. Now think about those three options for a second and tell me which one you think was the most popular reaction to that kind of scenario. Option number two. Close the blinds, don't tell anybody what you saw and hope that it all goes away. This is the tragedy of what happens to human beings in a police state dictatorship. Is that you are not going to stand up for anybody because you're terrified for your own life. And the silence of the German people, their, in, their unwillingness to act, either individually or collectively, is what allowed Nazism to flourish. Would those conditions created the same reaction in France, in Britain, Canada, the United States, if we had a dictatorship? Absolutely. There's no question that the conditions would have been the same. So there was nothing really intrinsically German about the Nazis. Uh, and while they did have a history of Prussian mi militarism, rather, um, this kind of thing could have happened anywhere. So interesting things to think about. He implemented public work schemes like the Autobahn to get people back to work, but all employment veered towards military buildup. Even the Autobahn, you know, I mean, look at this massive uh, highway network, the most modern in the world at the time, uh, lauded as, you know, the greatest uh, engineering feat in the modern world. And not only did, you, did we build you a great highway, we're going we're gonna to build you uh, cheap vehicles, the VW Bug of course, rolls off the assembly line in 1937, although the disruptions of the war prevented the mass dis sale of these things. But, um, you know, at the time, people were thinking, wow, this is great, I can travel from Frankfurt to, you know, uh, Munich and Munich to Berlin in no time now, and I can drive as fast as I want because there's no speed limit. Um, we now know that the function of the Autobahn was to move troops quickly, move supplies to the front. So, you know, Everything that the Nazis were doing in terms of employment was geared towards the preparation for an inevitable war. And this is what makes the story of appeasement so shameful, that it should have been very, very clear to everyone what Hitler was doing. We'll come back to that shortly. Abolishing all parties and trade unions and ruled with an iron fist like Stalin and Mussolini. It almost sounds like a cliche, ruling with an iron fist. We've heard it many times before. Uh, but they all did. You know, they all were intolerant, and they all were uh, repressive, and um, they were able to achieve their political ends through a, 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 a climate of fear that existed. Racism in, uh, was cornerstone to Nazi philosophy as they tried to create a master race while demonizing Jews, Gypsies, and Slavs. Now, of course, this is the ugly example of what separates Nazism from the other modern dictators that there was a, a, a malevolent policy of, of, of malignant racism, that, that you are taking you know, social Darwinism to a whole new height, the idea that some people are better than others because of the color of their skin, and as a result, because we're better than other people, we have every right to conquer and exploit and take control of other people. You know, um, this kind of racism is what leads to uh, arrogant conquest, you know, well we can go wherever we want. If you can't defeat us and we run roughshod over you, then that's because you're weaker and we're better. So it's a pretty dark chapter when a society, a government, has a system in place that is built upon the premise of racial superiority, but that was cornerstone and it became an excuse to eliminate people with special needs, to eliminate homosexuals, gypsies, Jews, ethnic minorities, you name it, everybody that the, that the Nazis would deem as un-German. Communists, the disabled, and homosexuals were also persecuted. Everyone lived in fear. 
Uh, on November 9, 1938, Nazi mobs attacked Jewish businesses across Germany known as Kristallnacht or Crystal Night because of all the broken glass. Kristallnacht, November 9, 1938, is a significant turning point in the history of pre-war Nazi Germany. And the reason I say it is, is the people that I've spoken to and the accounts that I've read from civilians uh, who lived in Germany at the time said, and I've heard this many times, that all those good, hard-working, middle-class, liberal, open-minded human beings who kept their mouth shut through this whole process to save their own skin, um, that was the point that many of them realized that their silence had allowed Nazism to flourish. And that by 1938, when the synagogues were burning, Nobody was in a position to defy the Nazis unless you were willing to risk your life. And nobody wants to die for a cause. Um, most people don't. Anyway, so Kristallnacht, Crystal Night, which was uh, uh, SA, SA attacks on Jewish synagogues and businesses, the Night of Broken Glass, was a huge turning point in the history of pre war Nazi Germany. Alright, so in 1931, Japan invades the Chinese industrial province of Manchuria, and in 1935, Italy invaded Ethiopia. Now, when we get to the Second World War, uh, really, World War II begins, and we're talking about the Pacific Theater and the European Theater. Um, World War II really starts when the Japanese invade Manchuria, and they invade Manchuria because they uh, want the resources. Uh, <laughs> which at that time was under Chinese control. You know, one of the interesting things about the Japanese Imperial Armies and the Japanese leadership is you have to consider that there are remarkable commonalities between Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan. And in the history of militarism and fascism, rarely if ever have we ever used the moniker fascism when we talk about Imperial Japan. Why is it that they are exempt from being called a fascist dictatorship. They were militaristic, they were nationalistic, they were imperialistic, they were beset with a racial superiority con uh, conflict, uh, 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 superior, what's the word I'm looking for? You know the one, complex. Um, they were beset with that kind of complex as well as the Nazis, and which is why they ran roughshod over China. I mean, the reality was that um, uh, the atrocities committed at the hands of the uh, Japanese Imperial Armies, particularly in China, and the starkest example of that would be in the Rape of Dan King, um, which the details of which I'll spare you, but if you're interested in that kind of thing, uh, it was an absolute horror show what happened in Dan King. Um, that, why is it that Japan does not get thrown and lumped in as a fascist nation? I would argue that they, they were at the time. Of course, eventually they do come into um, a friendship with uh, the Italians and the, the Nazis later as well. So, As the West did little to nothing in response to the League of Nations, Hitler took notice and rebilitarized the Rhineland. The League did not take any action. Of course, the League of Nations was intended to um, provide a place for sorting out collective security issues and having nations come together to, to discuss differences and hammer them out in a gentlemanly, rational, pragmatic way. Uh, dictatorships had no interest in being part of the League of Nations. Certainly the Nazis or the, or the Japanese or the Italians snubbed their nose at the League because the League couldn't do anything when Hitler went into the Rhineland or, or Mussolini goes into Ethiopia, at that point known as Abyssinia. The League of Nations was powerless to stop them because they did not have an army and all they could do is say, no, don't do that or we're going to stop buying you stuff. Well, the Japanese and the Nazis were far too arrogant to give a darn what the League of Nations was willing to do. So, In Spain in 1936, General Francisco Franco and his Falange fascist followers led an attack on Spain's government and overthrew the democratic government there with German and Italian support. To me, the Spanish Civil War is far too often left out of the story of appeasement. Um, it is undervalued and understudied, I believe, in that period. 
Um, maybe because there's a little bit of regret, maybe there is some, um, I'd say regret would be the right word in the, from the perspective of the British and French, because what happens in Spain is very interesting. And bear with me, I'll give you just a quick rundown on what happened. 1931, the monarchy collapses to democratic pressures in Spain. They have their first elections. They elect a popular front government, which is re-elected again, I believe, in 35 or 36. A popular front government is a broad coalition of left and right-wing parties that come together to form a single group to run a party. So the popular front governments uh, existed, of course, in France and in Spain, although I'd argue that the the Spanish uh, popular front government was considerably more powerful on the left than the French one, but uh, nonetheless, you have this broad democratic coalition. When they come into power for the second time in 1936, um, the numbers of the Communist Party that, that are within the coalition increase. And um, once they begin to implement more land reform and removing party, uh, rather land from the Catholic Church, Elements in Spain's military were furious because in addition to that, the new Spanish government was, was reducing uh, the amount of money they were going to provide for the military. So Francisco Franco is one of the key generals in the French, um, or rather the Spanish military, um, heads a group of uh, anti-government forces that engage in a struggle directly against this Spanish popular front government. and. Um, because it's a democratic government, we, one would automatically think, well, the West should have helped. Uh, but they didn't. And they had an official policy of non-intervention, which meant that they're not going to get involved. We're not, gonna, we're not going to support anybody. You know, the, why did the French and British not support, support democracy in Spain? I believe that the reason they did not support the Republican government was because of the significant influence the communists held and they were afraid that by giving support to the republic in Spain did that mean that they were supporting communism in Spain. Um, so I think it put them in a very difficult dilemma. The irony being that Britain and France had, France had a policy of non-intervention and then Italy and Germany pounded Spain with their dive bombers, they practiced their blitzkrieg tactics, you name it on the cities of Madrid and Guernica and others. So the tragedy of, of appeasement really is magnified in the, in the narrative of Spain because in 1939 the fascist forces are victorious, they overthrow the Republican government and then World War II breaks out. So, and the, Spain, the Spanish were never part of World War II either. So. All democratic countries thought the League of Nations had a policy of non-intervention. Um, Sorry, all democratic countries through the League of Nations had a policy of non-intervention, but volunteers arrived from all over the world. Um, quite a remarkable story. Uh, you know, a lot of Canadians um, who, were, uh, who lost everything in Canada, who were out on the skids, were mobilized by um, the Canadian Communist Party, led by Tim Buck, who offered these guys something to do. Hey, you want to go to fight fascism in Spain? And a lot of... I think upwards of between 1,200 and 1,600 Canadians went to Spain as volunteers, uh, some with no military training, shot their first rifle, uh, went in Spain, um, but they left the country illegally because it was illegal for Canadians to go to fight in Spain. And that was the same policy of all the other democratic nations. So you couldn't even go there out of good conscience to support the Spanish Republic because it was against the law from your own government. So. Canadian volunteers called the Mackenzie Papineau Battalion, numbered over 1,200. The book I was working with initially said 1,200, but I've seen upwards of 14 to 1,600. But either way, somewhere between 1,200 and 1,600 Canadians went. You notice their name, Mackenzie Papineau, and that is the name of the two leaders of the 1837 Upper and Lower Canadian Rebellions. So, interesting stuff. One volunteer was Dr. Norman Bethune, here he is here, a surgeon and political activist from Ontario. Uh, another individual who probably deserves his own lecture because his life was so fascinating. Um, he spent time in Spain, of course he was there, he was the one who came up with the mobile blood transfusion unit. He would then, I believe, go to um, 
China during the civil war there and work alongside Mao Zedong and the Communist Party who were fighting a war against the Kuomintang, Chiang Kai-shek, uh, from 19, roughly 1927 to 1949 when the Communists would take over. Bethune was a no-nonsense kind of a guy. He uh, made no qualms about his allegiance to the Communist Party. That's why he was in Spain and China. Um, profoundly arrogant. It's very interesting. I was doing a lecture in a retirement home recently and an elderly couple had mentioned that, um, or the, the lady said that her father uh, practiced with Norman Bethune and they absolutely despised him because he was vain and arrogant and had um, the tendency to drink when he did uh, surgeries and on many occasions he had to be removed from surgeries because he was too drunk to operate. I only know this from someone who actually told me to what extent that was pervasive in his career is a whole other question. But you know, the left really lauds Norman Bethune as this great hero. And I think in many ways he was extremely well intentioned. He put his life on the line. He dies in China uh, from blood poisoning, I believe, um, doing so many transfusions in China. So, um, a, a, you know, a very interesting character. And, uh, you know, people are very conflicted about how they feel about him, but uh, nonetheless, a uh, very interesting uh, topic for sure. So Germany's aggression in the mid-30s led the Western democracies to adopt a policy called appeasement because no one wanted to fight another war. That's pretty well what it comes down to, folks, that Britain and France decided to disengage uh, because they thought if they just give the Nazis what they want to a certain degree, and we can prevent a war, then, then, then that's good. <clears throat> the memories of the Great War were still far too fresh for many people, and I think um, um, giving in to the Nazis from time to time will satiate their appetite and all this will go away. The fundamental problem with this kind of thinking is I like to use the bully metaphor. So for example, on a school field, in an elementary school, if you get a kid who um, you know, punches kids during recess and then the, the principal calls him into the office and says, look, you can't be punching kids. That's wrong. Okay, I promise not to do it anymore. And then you give the bully a sucker and off he goes to the class. What's the one thing he's going to remember? When he punches a kid in the head, he's going to get a sucker. Uh, I know it's a crass metaphor, but at the end of the day, that's what the Nazis were doing. It was push, push, push. Let's try this. Let's bomb Guernica. Nobody's doing anything. Let's cross the bridges into the Rhineland and remilitarize. They didn't do anything. Let's go into Austria. So the problem was that we were so focused on the idea that just give him enough to satiate his appetite and it will go away, when in fact it just, it just built his desire to continue to take, 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 take. He's the wrong guy. Hitler was the wrong guy to appease. October 36, Berlin and Rome uh, become an axis, and it was, as I said before, even though they were not on good terms, it was their mutual desire to get involved in the Spanish Civil War that brought them together. 1937, Japan comes on board in the Anti-Comintern Pact, which means an anti-communist pact, interesting here, that what bonded Japan, Italy, and Germany together was an anti-Soviet, anti-communist pact to stop the spread of Soviet influence. So, 1938 was the Anschluss with Austria. Of course, when the Nazis roll into Austria, everyone throws flowers and cheers because they're a German-speaking nation and Hitler himself is Austrian. Munich, the Great Betrayal, as it's called by some, uh, gave Sudetenland to Germany. Sudetenland is a horseshoe ring of territory that was on the western side of Czechoslovakia where German-speaking people existed. The Sudeten Germans were German-speaking peoples. Six months later, Hitler occupies the rest of Czechoslovakia. When Hitler started to make warlike comments against Poland where he wanted to regain East Prussia, and East Prussia was cut off from the rest of Germany with the Polish corridor, and that came out of the Treaty of Versailles because in order to ensure that the new state of Poland had access to the sea, they had to, they had to disconnect East Prussia from the rest of Germany. Unfortunately, I need a map for that section, but uh, you get the point, hopefully. Um, Russia at this time 
In the story of appeasement, Russia is silent. No overtures were ever made to Russia during all this. They were never part of any of these discussions. And some historians argue and believe that the purpose of appeasement was quite malevolent, was intended to push the Nazis east so that they could beat the heck out of the Russians and the Russians could be, beat the heck out of them and they could fight a war somewhere over eastern Poland or the Ukraine and the West could completely stay out of it. Um, it's an interesting thesis. I don't know if it can ever actually be proven. I think the Soviets took this perspective that they felt that appeasement, they felt like they were being thrown under the bus. But, you know, so I think Hitler, or rather Stalin, realizes things are getting too close for comfort. Stalin was not ready for a war in 1939. He just decapitated his military in the Great Purges. So he then would sign the Nazi-Soviet Pact. Appeasement fails. Stalin signs the pact on August 24, 1939. War breaks out one week later when Germany invades Poland on September 1, 1939. Once Hitler had the green light that the Soviets were not going to get involved, he was good to go. And what's interesting with the Nazi-Soviet Pact is it, it was agreed that they both would divide um, uh, Poland amongst them and in fact the Soviets invade from the east and the Nazis from the west and they meet halfway wave at each other and off they go so um, appeasement was a, a, pr a profound failure and you know the Nazi Soviet pact caught everybody off guard because everybody knew the Nazis to be fiercely anti-communist and uh, everyone knew that the Soviets had made strong pronouncements against the rise of fascism and so on and so forth so Having these two come together really was quite a shock. So, how did Canada respond to all these international events? Well, throughout these events, Canada remained isolationist. Memories of 60,000 dead in World War I, in addition to a feeling that the Treaty of Versailles was too harsh, led for a desire of disengagement. We were not really, we were members of the League of Nations, but we were not really active in the military, or in the, um, in the heavy decision making of the League of Nations. Uh, Mackenzie King would travel to Germany in 1937 and he would meet Adolf Hitler, seeing him then as a sincere uh, person and that Hitler had no warlike intentions. You know, holy mackerel, I'm sure that if Mackenzie King could have erased this part of his history, he would have loved to have done that. Uh, he was swooned by Hitler. Hitler could be charming. Hitler knew what to say and how to say it. and. Um, I think, unfortunately, uh, Mackenzie King walked away with, uh, he'd been hoodwinked by Hitler very cleverly because, of course, within two years there'd be war in Europe. So. While aware of persecuting of the Jews, Mackenzie King did not see a need to accept Jews while Canada was still dealing with unemployment. In reality, anti-Semitism was a factor. Immigration Minister Feed Blair claimed none is too many. Boy, for an immigration minister to say something like that? I mean, you would never hear anything like that now. None is too many. The ocean liner St. Louis with 900 Jewish refugees was refused entry into Canada. In fact, they weren't let in anywhere. They tried, I think they tried in Cuba and the United States. They ended up being shipped back to Europe. What a tragedy that was, my gosh. And a real stain on sort of the history of Canada in many ways. 165,000 Jewish people living in Canada could not help but see these actions with great concern and many liberal presses were critical of Canadian policy. There were voices in Canada who said, why on earth would we not take these refugees knowing what they are subjected to in Germany? I mean, a lot of it was just rumor anyway. They didn't really know. They'd heard things, they'd read articles, they'd, they'd seen film clips when they go to a movie. Um, and the warning signs were there, but I guess maybe people naively thought that, well, it can't get much worse than that. I mean, who could have ever anticipated that the Nazi regime would institute industrialized slaughter of a human race? It's quite remarkable. So I don't think anybody could have predicted the Holocaust. So, All right, and that being said, we're going to leave it at that uh, for today. So thank you very much for coming to view my YouTube lecture. 
Um, this is the precursor to a two-part uh, lecture that we're going to be looking at that deals with Canada during the Second World War. So have a look at that. It'll be marked as such, Canada, part, Canada in World War II, Part 1 and Part 2. So thank you very much and have a wonderful day. We'll see you next time.